Well, sweetie, I tell you what, if I'm doing anything wrong in this government, just tell me about it. Martha Mitchell hit this town like a bombshell. In fact, she is getting to be known as the unguided missile. But I do say what I please. <laughs> it wasn't that the president didn't like women. He didn't like loud women. <laughs> She was the first to say Nixon should resign. This man knew what was going on. He was negligent in being president. Uh, did you see what Martha Mitchell did? No. He called somebody. He called the New York Times. She wanted to protect John, but I don't think she knew how involved John really was. She went over the break this time of a sudden, these rumors start flying out of the White House. I think she was scared all the time something else might happen to her. I'll tell them all. And you know what they're going to do. They'll probably end up killing me. Was she a crazy lady? I certainly don't think so. I think she was visionary, prophetic. If I have something on my mind, I'm not going out and yell it to anybody unless I believe it's what should be said. I'm convinced if it hadn't been for Martha, there'd have been no water. We're teaching the politicians to be straight and not crooked. That was the trailer for the Oscar-nominated short documentary, The Martha Mitchell Effect. And this is Factual America. I'm your host, Matthew Sherwood. Each week I watch a hit documentary and then talk with the filmmakers and their subjects. This week we have a special treat for you as we interview the filmmakers behind three of the five nominees for Best Short Documentary at the 2023 Academy Awards to be held on March 12th. The Martha Mitchell Effect tells the story of the woman who brought down the Nixon administration. Joining us are the directors and producers who tell us what it was like to turn this amazing but seemingly forgotten story into an Oscar-nominated short documentary. Then we'll be joined by Jay Rosenblatt, the award-winning director of How Do You Measure a Year, also nominated for Best Short Documentary at this year's Academy Awards. Jay interviewed his daughter Ella every year on her 2nd through 18th birthdays and documented those sessions on film. During the pandemic, he turned that footage into a loving and poignant film that says so much about growing up, the passage of time, and the relationship between a father and a daughter. Last, but certainly not least, is Joshua Seftel, the award-winning director of Stranger at the Gate. This short tells the incredible story of an ex-U.S. Marine who plans a terrorist attack in a mosque in a small American town. His plan takes an unprecedented turn when he comes face-to-face with the people he is trying to kill, forcing him to confront his own actions. This promises to be an excellent episode as we gear up for Oscars night. So stay tuned. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Factual America. Congratulations. And how are things are with, with you all? Doing well. Good. We're yeah. great. Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much We're uh, for our listeners and viewers. We're talking about the Martha Mitchell Effect, uh, nominated for Best Short Doc at this year's Academy Awards currently streaming on Netflix, so do catch it there. And um, I, I, if people haven't had a chance to uh, to check it out yet, uh, maybe we'll start with you, Anne, one of the uh, co-directors. Uh, well, how, do, how does it feel to be nominated for an Oscar? I mean, what was it, what was it like when you, who got the call? So we were actually all on a <laughs> Zoom call, um, or a Zoom video, I should say, yeah. um, watching it uh, live. Um, so we all heard about it, uh, at the same time, although I think a couple of them got some text messages earlier, so they kind of had more of a uh, hint than, than I a, did. I, I was By a few seconds. A few yeah, seconds. Just a few seconds. Yeah. Yeah. I was completely surprised. Um, you know, I think we thought there were, um, you know, we knew we were in contention, but, mm-hmm. uh, there were some front runners that we, that at least I expected. And when I didn't see them come up even though I didn't realize I should have known it was alphabetical. But anyway, I did it. And uh, when I didn't see them come up, I thought, oh, no, oh, no, we're not, we're not going to be part of the fight. But then we were. So that was very exciting and surprising at the same time. It was kind of a nice mixture. Oh, well, uh, I mean, for those who haven't had a chance, uh, Deborah, maybe you can tell us um, 
What is the Martha Mitchell effect all about? Uh, maybe you can give us a synopsis. I'm talking about the film, not the psychological uh, <laughs> definition. Sure. Well, Martha Mitchell was the wife of the Attorney General John Mitchell in the Nixon administration. So the film is really her story about um, you know coming into the administration as someone who was very popular very much a celebrity. The Nixon administration really enjoyed her sort of vivaciousness and her um, her friendliness with the press, and they really garnered that sort of soft power that she wielded. Um, and then, you know, later on in the administration, things took a drastic turn. After California, when she was there during the break-in and they contained her so that she wouldn't get wind of it, um, she did anyways. Um, and yeah, and that's the primary basis of the film. Okay, and uh, I think uh, you've, as you put in the, as in the film shows, are, or even have him saying it, I believe, uh, Richard Nixon. Uh, yeah, in the David Frost interview, says there'd be no Watergate without Martha, as, as he felt felt. Um, um, and she was a um, an outspoken woman in a in a time and era, and when Washington D.C. that that wasn't necessarily the the done thing uh but judith why i mean as some i'm may surprise some i'm a as a geeky five six seven year old i was uh i knew very well what was going on with watergate and uh at the time my uh parents every evening would watch the 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 replay of the hearings and stuff um but why is martha mitchell sort of disappeared from that narrative i would i would say um, many can name all the different actors to this day, Mitchell, Ehrlichman, Haldeman, but, uh, her name doesn't come up as much usually. Yeah. Um, I, you know, we think it's because the, the gaslighting campaign against her really was effective when, um, we talk to a lot of people now, either they don't know who she is at all, or they, they have, you know, they, they kind of remember her as being, you know, just kind of drunk or crazy and they don't really remember much at the time she was incredibly popular and well known so um she really was you know she has been pretty effectively erased and discredited um and you know it was a very deliberate campaign against her okay and beth uh why make this film now what is what's inspired you to 50 years on besides being a anniversary maybe with a zero at the end uh why why are we uh why are we f- talking about Martha Mitchell? Yeah, I mean I just want to add to Judas if I can a little bit which is I think it also speaks to the power of popular culture in some ways. I think mm. the gaslighting campaign was absolutely effective, but this is a story that's become defined by all the president's men and that's what we think about when we right. think about this story in many ways. Certainly why I was drawn to it because I knew nothing about her and her presence was so diminished in that story. So I just wanted to sort of tag team that, that I think the gaslighting was effective and that also kind of the whole, the the popular culture and the story that it passed down has had an effect on what we recall or what we remember, what we don't. We wanted to make this film now because we felt like it was an absolutely current story despite it being 50 years old. I mean, this was during the last administration and it was weekly, the women who spoke truth to power and Mm. were gaslighted by that administration. And it was infuriating and uh, just, it, it just felt like the time for this film was now. So there was a period of time where we thought about it being a feature Um, And we knew it would take longer to make for many reasons. And then because we felt it was so timely, um, it was one of the reasons that we really pushed to make a short. And so unfortunately, the themes of the film are still absolutely relevant and present today. And and that's in the popular culture, too. And we really wanted to bring her voice forward um, to start a new conversation um, around Watergate, the story that many think that they know, and also around the systemic gaslighting of mm-hmm. women who speak truth to power in politics. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think as someone who grew up in the United States and what I do remember, I probably would have said the same thing if you'd asked me a few weeks ago, uh, who was Martha Mitchell? Well, John Mitchell's wife, and probably would have thought would have come into my head that 
she was a drunk or she was, you know, whatever she, she was portrayed to be. And then this isn't, I mean, I hear you what you're saying about the last administration, but this isn't just that administration. We've had many cases of uh, over the years uh, through administra- sure. at different levels, certain through politics. Um, it's For always, sure. you know, uh, I mean, maybe I haven't even thought about asking this, but I, I alluded to this early on about the, the psychological, I mean, hence the where you get inspiration for the name, but maybe what if you could tell us, I mean, what is the Martha Mitchell effect? Uh, I mean, and it's, I think it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it was originally coined by Brendan Mayer, who was a Harvard psychiatrist in 1988. And it's essentially a process in which a medical professional labels a patient's story or depiction of events as delusional when in fact they turn out to be true. You know, um, so that's the definition. I mean, for the purposes of our film, it's also the effect of Martha Mitchell as a figure of her time. You know, she swept through D.C. as an outlier. And, uh, you know, she had a larger effect on Nixon and his administration than she was initially given credit for. Say, how did this project come about? How did you all come together? This is a, I, I imagine there's a story here as well. Yeah, I can take that one. Um, so Anne and I are longtime friends. Um, and we decided that we wanted to make a film um and we're looking for stories to tell looking for stories about interesting powerful influential women great stories about women um and as a reaction to the 2016 election we had heard martha's story and um got really fascinated by her didn't know anything about her couldn't believe that we didn't know anything about her. Mm. So we started doing some research and thinking of her as, you know, a potential character and looking at clips on YouTube and seeing how telegenic she was and just what an amazing kind of presence that she had. And she was funny and charismatic. So we started digging even further to find a documentary that would have been made about her. And lo and behold, there wasn't one. So we decided to embark upon it and did a deep dive into research. Um, going to the Nixon Library mm-hmm. and, you know, going to other archives, Vanderbilt Archive, um, any number of archives, just to uncover the story that actually was there that just other people hadn't really uncovered in documentary form. Yeah. Um, so it began there. And then we brought on Judith and Beth as our producers a little later on. Um, and they really helped us get this film made and get it over the finish line. And we're you know, super crucial to the whole process of storytelling. Um, so, yeah, so that's kind of the genesis of it. Okay. And uh, Judith and Beth, I mean, why a short? Uh, because I potentially there's enough here for a feature. I mean, as I've already said, I couldn't get enough of Martha. I've watched a, <laughs> more, than, more than 40 minutes. So uh, how did that, uh, or whoever wants to answer that, uh, why did you settle on a, on a short form? I, I can take it because um, it, it feel like it, it, we went back and forth a lot about this. I think originally, you know, Deborah and I conceived of it as a short. Uh, we wanted to keep it archival, so we knew we'd be limited to the material that we had. And then when we started to, you know, gather and compile and sort of lay out a chronology and a, a really fat assembly to tell the whole story and to tell the Watergate saga, we thought, well, maybe we could make it into a feature. And we. We, we pitched it around, but we just never got a lot of traction. And then we sort of circled back to the short and thought we could really, um, you know, Martha is, at that point was not um, a familiar name. Mm-hmm. Um, we weren't sure how much she could carry a, a feature, um, although I, I certainly am confident that she could have. But at that time, it, it was a little unclear. And, um, you know, the archival costs were so prohibitively expensive. Um, <laughs> You know, so we, we and yeah. we didn't have any money at that point. Um, so uh, so we sort of pivoted to a short. I would say we pivoted to a, uh, a you know, a long short. We sort of compromised at 40 minutes. Yeah. I mean, it's technically slightly over 40 minutes. Is that but that didn't count against you, did it? No, it, it, it's 40. It's 40. It's, it has it's to be 40 on the nose. It has to be 40 on the nose. OK, so Netflix. It's funny what shows. I think that must include uh, that's well, no. That's that's good to know. Um, I mean, that's an interesting point you make because I have I know people have told me stories of pitching and things where they've said, uh, you know, people who I won't say who they are, but you, pretty big names, and get told, well, we still don't think that's someone that's big enough to to carry a feature. I mean, is that uh, 
it's 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 an interesting one, isn't it? I mean, it's uh, what what does and doesn't fly on with pitches these days. Well, if I can just add to that, I mean, it wasn't really a consideration. Could she carry a feature? She yeah. can carry a feature. But I think it was the issue the in getting into the weeds. It was an issue of cost. Mm. It was yeah. an issue of time. And, yeah. you know, time is money. And we really wanted to restore Martha's agency to her. Mm. And in order to make the film longer, we would have had to bring other elements into the film. There was the possibility that we could have diluted her voice. Mm. So in these 40 minutes, we're really able to focus on Martha and her story and largely through her words mm. and experience. And so we thought it could be a more powerful experience as well mm. through a short. And, you know, it was that constant question, like what's best for the film? What will make the best film? And that's where we landed. Well, and I, yeah. and, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah, just to just to pick up on that, that's a, that's a great point. I mean, I think you know, not only do we want to do an archival film, but we wanted to restore her agency, right, as the sort of hidden mm. figure. And in, in order to do that, we want to prioritize her voice. And we were limited to the even though she was incredibly popular with the press, we were still limited yeah. in terms of what yeah. she said in interviews. So, well, and I wouldn't yeah. disagree with you in this. Were, oh, go ahead, Beth, uh, Deborah. Sorry. Uh, we also knew from the beginning, Anne and I, when we talked about her story, that we didn't want to do it from, you know, day one. We weren't interested really in doing from, like, they right. call it a cradle to grave type yeah. narrative. Yeah. We really wanted to focus on this particular time period and what really happened with her Watergate experience. So that sort of informed the length as well. Although I will say, making this long short felt like making a feature at times because it was pretty, uh, pretty intense. <laughs> yeah, and I don't want to, I mean, I think it's, I think it's perfect in many, in many ways by leave, leaving someone like me wanting for more, that's actually the perfect place to leave us, isn't it? Um, um, exactly. I, I mean, you know, you were talking about that archive. I mean, um, it, it was, obviously that's part of the consideration of how you bring her to life. And I think the film does such an amazing job of bringing her back to life. I mean, was there, what were some of the conversations you were having about about that or you or were you pretty much limited to just a certain amount of archive and you had to do the best you could with that yeah sure we were certainly limited by what we could find you know there weren't any home movies of martha for instance mm. um so we were really limited by a lot of the news footage that we found of her but so much of it is so incredible and she her character comes through and her personality comes through um so clearly through a lot of that um and then we really, we leaned on for the Watergate story and for the Nixon administration, mm -hmm. all those incredible Super 8 movies that right. Ehrlichman and Haldeman filmed. Right. And that stuff just looks amazing. And it's such an amazing record of these young men um, documenting their time in the administration. Mm -hmm. um, so that stuff was great and really fun to work with. So yeah, we did a really deep dive and I think we found a lot of amazing things. We found a an interview of Martha that hadn't been seen since the seventies when it came on. Um, and it was in, you know, the reporter's attic, he unearthed a tape that he didn't even realize had been there and had uncovered it and got it transferred and we were able to include it in the film. So there are some real like discoveries and gems that we were able to use. Yeah. And I loved seeing Helen Thomas. I mean, uh, I used to live in Washington D.C. I know which restaurant she used to hang out at. It was one of my favorites. Is too too my my wife and our uh, favorite. So uh, when did you, uh, Judith, maybe uh, or or Beth, uh, when did you get an inkling that this one was going to be? I mean, obviously you knew you had a great subject, things were going well. When did you have an inkling this was? Uh, you know, even saying at the beginning, you kind of were hoping, you felt like you might have a chance of getting a making the the short list and uh, being nominated but when did you know that this was this was this one had stood a good chance of being nominated you know i think it's been a it's been a process we certainly you know from the beginning from our early meetings there was so much interest in in martha's story um and i think yeah throughout the last you know two years really there's there's been great uh feedback and it's been interesting to us to see like how many uh, people in general, but, you know, women have really, really supported this project. I think so many women can relate to this. Um, you know, obviously, like, there's major gaslighting that happens in, like, the highest levels of government, but there's also, you know, just 
women being kind of silenced, whether it's in the workplace or or even at home. So I think just women really got behind the story. And yeah, we just over the I mean, it's not really answering your question, but I think we've just, it's been a great um, yeah. journey these last two years and, and then bringing on, Nef- you know, Netflix coming on board is like a fantastic partner mm. uh, and really, really supporting this story, um, I think was the beginning. Okay. So. All right. Uh, may just add, and I, sh- I shouldn't have the last word, but uh, I just to say that uh, um, as someone who's, maybe it's my age, I've always kind of struggled with exactly what this term gaslighting really means. It's kind of come to the fore in the last few years. And I feel like watching this film is the very definition. It helps me. I don't think I've ever had a better idea of what we're talking about when we when, when people use the term properly. I think it's probably been overused uh, mm-hmm. of late. But uh, uh, absolutely amazing. Um, I really enjoyed it. And... Um, I mean, what's what's next for you all? You all going to the to the uh, Oscars? Are you gonna? You're all showing up. We're gonna see you on the red carpet and uh, all that. Hopefully, if they yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if they turn their that's the plan. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. We're, yeah. We've been told to get there early. <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna be waiting at the velvet rope, seeing whether they'll that's let right. you in or not. Okay. We're gonna be the first one there. <laughs> okay. Hey, well, I uh, this. It's it's a very short, uh, relatively short interview. I don't I, I don't think we're doing the film justice, but at the same time, it is a short. I don't want it to the interview to be longer than the film. Um, and I think um, um, I just thank you all again. I thought this was this is one of these lovely ones, as you say, someone who's kind of people for whatever reason, for all the wrong reasons, have forgotten about this figure, mm-hmm. and she's such an incredible figure and an important figure, and and certainly in American history. So so um, thank you all. Um, and if you make another one of these, we'd love to have you on again. And so good luck. And, um, yes, thanks. Thanks again for coming on. And just to say, uh, just want to give a big thanks to the filmmakers of the Marsha Mitchell, the Martha, not Marsha, my goodness, the Martha Mitchell effect nominated in the best short doc category streaming on Netflix. Next, we'll talk with Jay Rosenblatt, award-winning filmmaker and two-time Oscar nominee about his film, How Do You Measure a Year? Here's a short trailer. I think now. Okay. Oh, yeah. Hi. Hi. Test, 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 test. Testing one, two, three. Jay Rosenblatt, welcome to Factual America. How are things with you? Very good, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Well, it's it's great to have you on and have you on again. Um, uh, the film this time is How Do You Measure a Year? Uh, nominated for Best Short Doc at this year's Academy Awards. Um so, I mean, I asked you last time, how does it feel to be nominated for an Oscar? How does it feel to be nominated for a, a, a second time? Did you have any inkling that this this would happen? Um, did I have an inkling? Uh, I had a hope. Um, yeah. I knew that um, people were very moved by the film. So mm-hmm. I, I had gotten many comments from Cat- Academy members uh, just letting me know how much... It, yeah. worked for them and um so you know it it, it raised my hopes yeah. so i wouldn't say it was a complete surprise but it, it's a it's great i'm really happy about it yeah and is it i mean we'll talk more about what the film is is about shortly but is this one even more special than than the last one given the this the, it does involve your daughter um yeah it's you know it's very hard to compare the two films the last one uh, was a labor of love too. Uh, it took yeah. four years. It was a very personal story, um, and uh, you know, I, I collaborated with a lot of different people, artists, right. composers, and stuff like yeah. that. This one was uh, <clears throat> a much more simple and intimate mm. film to make, and you know. It goes without saying, I love the subject of this film so much. So <laughs> this one was probably more enjoyable yeah. uh, to edit um, mm. and 
because I, I could just watch uh, a lot of footage of her and not get tired. So, ever, so that everyone, so we can catch up our our, uh, our listeners and and viewers. Uh, maybe you can tell us, uh, give us a synopsis of how do you measure a year? What is what is it all about? So we know what, so they know what we're talking about. Yeah, sure. Um, well, this is a, I would say a longitudinal film maybe. where I started uh, filming my daughter on her birthday when she was two, and every year. We filmed her, I filmed her in the same spot, asking pretty much the same questions, adding a couple here and there as the years went on. And I did that for 17 years until she turned 18. So it's, uh, uh, you know, it's about watching time right in mm. front of you, seeing mm. someone just go from toddler to young woman, and also seeing how our relationship evolves. And so is it right? Because I think it says at the beginning, you didn't even look at these interviews for 17 years, was it? Um, I mean, why not? Did you just store them away? And uh, <laughs> were you thinking in the back of your mind that there was a film here? What What was up with that? Well, I always thought in the back of my mind there was a film. Uh, I didn't know for sure. Um, I, I should make it clear, I didn't see the first year for 17 years the last year i i had didn't see for like two or three years so right Where is that? but yeah. i never i never looked at the footage yeah and uh part of it was a superstition i w didn't know if it came out and i didn't want to know because if yeah. it didn't come out i would have been really upset and then i don't know if i would keep doing it because i would have missed a year or two and the reason i didn't know it came out was i was using an old camera I purposely right. wanted to stick with the same camera for all those years, even though technology had changed because I wanted the look to be the same. But as I was filming, I should say the first few years, a friend of mine was filming. Mm. But then from, I would say, about six or seven on, I did the filming alone. And it's not my strength, uh, <laughs> cinematography. The right. camera seemed to be on the blink. Like sometimes the sound would would go out. I had the headphones on and I wouldn't hear something and I go, oh no, the camera's breaking. So uh, I was, it was just like faith. I just kept using it. And at age 18, I decided I had a new camera a few years before, but I didn't switch over. But mm -hmm. at age 18, I decided to film with two cameras just to have the option to go to right. the new camera. And thank God when I looked at the footage, COVID had hit, I had some extra time. Right. On my hands, I looked at the footage, and it came out. And for the most part, it looked decent. A couple of years, the color was off, right. um, but I was able to fix that in the in the color correction, and the sound was was there for the most part. So, yeah. so yeah, I mean, I was very relieved, but I still didn't know if I had a film. I had to watch it all, right. and then uh, it it brought back so many memories, but as I'm watching it, I felt like each year there's a few little gems and I felt like I could turn this into a film. And what, what sparked you to actually go ahead and finally look at them and see if you I mean, had something? You know. you know, I knew I'd get to it at some point, but it was one of those things really on the back burner. Mm -hmm. And I had just finished When We Were Bullies. And I felt, uh, I kind of felt a void in my life creatively. And I said, well, yeah. maybe I should work on the uh, the birthday film or at least look at it. Yeah. So I, I that's, and COVID hit it. And I have a, I have a regular full-time day job, but um, I still have more time on my hands. And, mm. and that seemed like a good moment to do it. Well, thank, thank goodness you did. I mean, yeah. uh, you, uh, uh so, and I'm just thinking about what you, I mean, there's so many things about this film, especially as I myself as a father of an 18 year old uh, girl. Um, oh, wow. I can only, yes. I, I, uh, I'm not saying you have to be a father of an 18 year old girl to appreciate this film. In fact, I'm certainly not saying that, but it, it does give me a little certain perspective, I think. But, uh, um, I, but let me get back to the point. I mean, you, you asked the same questions every year. Is that right? And, and way back when, how did you choose those questions? Yeah. Um, like I said earlier, I did add a few questions as she got older, mm. but I didn't I didn't remove any questions. So there were there was a, a through line. Um, 
You know, I, at first, since I'm talking to a two-year-old, a three-year-old, a four-year-old, I had yeah. to do some questions that I felt like she could answer and some that right, would maybe right. challenge her a little bit. Yeah. So one of the challenging questions was I asked her, what, what does power mean? And that got some interesting responses through the years. <laughs> yeah. um, but then there were things like, what was your favorite thing this year? What What do you like to do the most? Um, I'd ask her some simple questions like, what's your favorite food and, and or movie? And then, you know, as time went on, I would ask, uh, and I always also asked about our relationship. I asked her how, how we were doing together and just to check in with her. So those were pretty consistent. I think, you know, when she was a bit older, I asked her, like, what would she like to say to her older self, like her 25-year-old right. yeah. self? Yeah. Right. Uh, and even when I did ask that, it was a hard concept for her. So I'm glad I didn't ask that when she was two or three, because she would, <laughs> it would go nowhere. And it would be, maybe wouldn't be fair, you know, to put her in that situation. Um, but I did want there to be a consistency and also, when I was editing, I was clear that I wasn't going to give the answer to every question every year because that would be very boring and redundant. Uh, so, yeah. I, you know, I, I picked and chose what I felt would exemplify in some in some ways that particular day of that year. Okay. Um, I, I actually want to ask you some more questions about your questions but uh let me just uh give our listeners uh and viewers a quick quick uh, early break here we'll be right back with award-winning and two-time oscar-nominated director jay rosenblatt how do you measure a year nominated in the best short doc category you're listening to factual america subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on facebook instagram or twitter at alamo pictures to keep up to date with new releases or upcoming shows Check out the show notes to learn more about the program, our guests, and the team behind the production. Now back to Factual America. We're back with the award-winning and two-time Oscar-nominated director Jay Rosenblatt. How Do You Measure a Year is the film, and it's nominated in the Best Short Doc category in this year's Oscars. We, we were talking about these questions you were asking your daughter every year on her birthday, and, um, I mean, they are... Uh, they're difficult ones even for an adult, let alone two to three year olds, some of them. And uh, I, I, you could be uh, you could be excused if you didn't, if, if you're a bit unknowing and not a parent, maybe thinking it comes across sometimes as a form of, of torture to ask some of these questions. But um, how did you come, why the power question? Why was that one that you um, wanted to, what were you trying to get to with, get to with that? Or what? Yeah. I should preface it with like, uh, and I say this in the film, I think it was like maybe uh, 17 or 18, where I, w I say, I'm not so sure I loved all the questions I asked. So I was, right. I was a little unsure of it myself. I mean, as time went on, I thought, oh, I wish I asked her about this and that. I, I mean, I'm happy with the way it turned out. And, yeah. um, but um, the power question, I think, because I, because she was a girl, I thought uh, that that would be an interesting question to ask. I wanted mm. her uh, to feel empowered growing up, and I thought if I, if we talked about power, maybe that would, you know, boost her confidence and understanding of that kind of dynamic. Um, and I think uh, in, in some ways, um, this came up in another interview I was doing, and I really agree with it. But it was really. Um, what came out of that was really um, love. It was really about love. I mean, power, yeah. in a sense, you could say, is really love um, in 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 this film. Um, I mean, she she has some funny responses to that yeah. question. Yeah. yeah. And then as she gets older, it becomes very interesting because she talks about. Um, I think she comes to this place where the, the power of being oneself you know that that takes a lot of power to really be yourself mm. and you know i think that's really uh, insightful um yeah and, yeah i think um, yeah the other questions you know that i, I just went, wanted to see where they went i mean she yeah. in some ways the questions aren't as important as just seeing 
her demeanor, her changing physically, emotionally, mm. Mm. Uh, psychologically, how she relates. You know, it's a it's more about that, and the questions are just like a, a springboard. To be honest, I, I completely agree, and that's what struck me the most. And okay, I'll play my dad's hat with this one, but I, you know, it was just. You know, it, it for me, it brought a lot of memories back. I mean, there's this part of me, I was even talking to my wife today, I said, I wish I had done something like this. She goes, <laughs> oh, oh, Mary would have never allowed you to do this. <laughs> you know, it, it would have just never have happened. But uh, um, yeah, and you can just see those, those you go from, okay, things two, three, four, and then there's like, you see, you see these big leaps in development yeah. from one year to the next. Yeah. And then there's the, you know, uh, you know, not to give away the film, people should go see it. But you know, the the rolling of the eyes and certain d different years and the uh, sort of attitude, you know, and the <laughs> I won't say, but you know, even when she was fourteen and the attitude she had when she was fourteen, and, and you know, and it's just, uh, yeah, yeah, obviously it was, and uh, you've you lived through that, and uh, you know, very, you know, that. I did what, where, you know, it's a loaded question. How's the relationship? And, you know, there's a couple of years there where she's talking about you're, you, you two are fighting, right? You know, yeah. and, and that's, unfortunately, it's sort of what happens with parents and especially girls as preteens, but then, and then teens and children in general. I mean, it's, uh, but yeah, there's just the, it is amazing. It's like, you know, there have been these longitudinal films. There's been seven and, uh, and up and these kind of things. But this right. is just this kind of, it's almost like that, um, that style of uh, you know the the filmmaking where they show the uh, the flowers slowly grow you know the, time, the lapse. time time lapse yeah it was completely uh, went brain dead on that one but like it's <laughs> it's time lapse photography there you know and you just see yes. this and yes. and then the and then the poignant answers absolutely yeah. uh, absolutely amazing I mean your um your films explore you know I think you. I, I don't know if it's a quote from you, but explore emotional and, you know, our emotional and a psychological core, I think is what it says on IMDb. Mm -hmm. um, is this your most personal film? And, and was it your own ex journey of, of exploration and going through, doing this, making this film and doing the edits? Um, yeah, you know, I think it was. Uh, I have made um, four films with Ella up until she was five. And that might um, explain why she was kind of agreeing and comfortable doing this because we had a little bit of a history right. of making films together, and it was it was a special thing we did together. Oh, not always pleasant, but we, in, for the most part, enjoyed the process. And a couple of those films went on to show on HBO, so she had a little bit of a sense of what she was getting into. Right, um, you know. I, like when your wife said that your daughter Mary wouldn't agree to that, I think no. I think Ella was was primed for this a little bit, um, mm -hmm. and the fact that um, I'm in it and she's in it and agreed to be in it, and uh, I would say yes, it is my most personal film on a certain level for sure. Um, although I have made personal films that deal with you yeah. know traumas in my life and. Um, so it, it, you know, there's, there's definitely other films that are very personal, but this one, yeah, is quite, quite personal, and, mm. I, you know, I'm glad that it affected you that way. I, I, I found that um, a lot of people have ended up watching it with their families, um, mm. or with their kids, and I didn't, I didn't plan on that or or think about that, and I'm really, it's very satisfying to me because, I think it, um, it does show this that you can get through certain stages. It does, yeah. Um, yeah. and I think people can maybe see themselves or their relationships in the film. Um, and I, I always like that. I, with all of my films, I I kind of strive for people to enter them with their yeah. own life memories, yeah. and hopefully it'll have some effect on them. Well, I tell you, and I, I mean, I actually haven't done it yet, but my first reaction was I'm, I should probably ask you for permission, but for the link to to share the link, but was to uh, share the sure, link with absolutely. her and to yeah, say, absolutely. would you, you know, I think you'd love, I think you would, you should watch this and not because I'm trying to be a dad and make a point or anything. I just think it's, it's just worth watching on its own. And it's, um, and it's just curious to see what she would, 
you know, what her reaction would be to it, you know? Sure. Um, I mean, what is Ella's, I mean, uh, what is, what does Ella think about the film? Well, you know, I showed it to her uh, when I was editing it. I showed her the first rough cut and a couple of cuts after that, just to get her uh, mm. approval, consent. Um, and, uh, you know, she was a little embarrassed by a couple of the scenes. Yeah. Um, but she talked it over with some of her friends and she came to the conclusion that it was all okay. And yeah. um, she actually came to us. I had one, only really one screening so far in a, in a mm. theater in, in the Bay Area. And um, right. she came. She was in from college. It, it was around Thanksgiving. And she actually came to the screening. And she, at some point, at, she came up on stage with me to answer some of the questions. And I was really right. impressed because she, she's very uh, reserved and shy now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't I didn't voice that on her. It was her choice. Yeah. But um, she was great on stage. And that made me feel like this is, maybe this is a, a good experience for her. I hope it stays that way. She's obviously thrilled with the uh, Oscar. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. She's yeah. going to be going with me, so. Excellent. Yeah, I think that's, Excellent. I think it's all good. Yeah. And then, I mean, and being, you know, so what is it like, I, I have one, one last sort of last question on this, but as being a father filming, I mean, you said you had the experience when she was younger, but in doing this, I mean, was it difficult to make in terms of the edit, what to cut and what to include and what do you, do you ever sense, well, do I, were you thinking, well, maybe I wouldn't include that because she, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, not wanting to embarrass her, you know, and e these sort right. of things. Yeah, I mean, I was sensitive to that for sure. Yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't, yeah, if she said, like, I can't, it won't work if you leave that in, I would have taken it out. But, yeah. um, but um, it was not that hard to edit because there was a, um, you know, I, each year I shot one tape, um, which lasted, I think, 45 minutes. Mm. So there was 17, you know, like 15 hours of yeah. Yeah. footage, not um, onerous. That's, yeah. Uh, it was pretty clear what the highlights were. Mm. I just had to really figure out how to keep the uh, momentum going, how to cut in and out of years, things like mm. that. Uh, she sings a lot in the film, which... Yeah. Which, you know, which songs do I include? Which ones have resonance with yeah. themes that are emerging? Um, it it kind of, yeah, it, it was, and it was, uh, like we said, I said earlier, it was so pleasurable that it it went quickly. It, unlike some films are like so painful yeah. to edit and to get through and just take so long. This was, this was a, a good experience. I really enjoyed it. Um, so no, I would I would say it wasn't a hard film to edit. It was because it was so enjoyable. Well, I think that comes through. I mean, I I, I thoroughly enjoyed your last year's film, and which was obviously a personal film as well. But you know, I think as you mentioned earlier, the, the about the love. I think that comes through. I think that comes through loud and clear. Um, right. And um, I think it's very poignant. It's very touching. I think it's it's one of those I. I've only watched it once, but I, I think it's one of those where I do want to go back and watch it again, a second or third time, because I, I like think that. there's something, uh, there's there's so much there in a in a very short period of time. So, um, I guess one last question, because uh, I probably don't want to make the interview longer than the film, but uh, the uh, <laughs> I'm, 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 <laughs> you yeah. know that making shorts, I'm aware of that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, is it uh, is, is there a chance? Uh, I don't think it's out yet. It's not been more widely distributed. Is that something that's still in the works? I'm just thinking in terms of those on this, uh, listening to this podcast who would, who'd like yeah. to check it out. Yeah. Um, hopefully that'll change. Um, but at this point it's the only short doc that's not, uh, doesn't have a distributor. Yeah, I was going to um, ask you about that is what's, what's the yeah, challenge. It's very challenging. Um, yeah. you know, um, I have a sales agent and we're yeah. hopefully hopefully that will change soon. It will be available on this uh, Shorts International TV puts out uh, all right. the Oscar shorts theatrically yeah. starting yeah. on the 17th of February. 
So it'll be in that program in like two to 300 cities around the country. Okay. Some in Europe. Excellent. So there will be an opportunity to see all the films together. And it's a, it's a good batch of films. So I think people will enjoy it. Yeah, no, definitely. Definitely check that out though. I've obviously I love that you want to see it a second time uh, because to me, that's, that that's a, a real compliment. Well, it's it's it, well. I'm glad you take it that way, and, I, and it certainly meant that way because I I do um, um, I've I don't know. I found it extremely poignant, and if nothing else, just kind of bring brought back a lot of my own personal memories. So um, so you know, I do. Uh, if if those listening, if you can get to that uh, that uh, that short uh, docs theatrical release, do and then be on the lookout for this. Uh, to be released and streamed more widely. So, uh, Jay, um, thanks again for coming on. We really enjoyed it. Thanks for keep making these these great short docs that you make. And uh, yeah, best of luck at the Oscars. And uh, you know, who knows? Maybe we'll have you again uh, next year. The way things uh, are going. I, I seriously doubt that, <laughs> since I don't have a film. But um, I appreciate the sentiment. I would love okay. to. It make this a yearly thing. Now. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, well, let's see what we can do about that. At least after maybe a year's year's gap. Um, so big thanks to Jay Rosenblatt. Uh, the film "How Do You Measure a Year?" nominated for best short doc at this year's Academy Awards. Do check it out wherever you can find it. And thanks again, Jay. Take care. Thank you, Matthew. For our final interview, we catch up with Joshua Seftel, award-winning filmmaker of *Stranger at the Gate*. Here's a short trailer. When I first saw him, I remember saying, there's something not right with this guy. It was a little scary. He seemed to be like a redneck. He was walking kind of fast, his head was kind of down, pacing back and forth. I was hoping for at least 200 or more dead, injured. You know, he thought he was doing the right thing. He was at war with Muslims in his mind. When I tell people this story, they tell me that they don't believe me. My dad calls my mom the Mother Teresa of the Muslim community, and it's definitely true. I invited him over for dinner. I couldn't help it except to make him feel from my heart that he is welcome. I could never in a million years repay this community what they've given me. Joshua Seftel, welcome to Factual America. How are things with you? Doing well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for having. Uh, thanks for coming on. Uh, uh, the film we're talking about is *Stranger at the Gate*, nominated for Best Short Doc at this year's Academy Awards. So, congratulations on your Oscar nomination. What was it like to receive the call? How did you find out? Well, we did a watch party, which I was very opposed to. Yeah, because I, I really did not want to sort of film a moment that might be very potentially very disappointing right. but we um we did it anyway there were six of us and we were all on camera and uh watching on zoom together right. and they you know they announced the first name and it wasn't us and we all kind of like crouched down a little and the second one third one fourth one we weren't still didn't name us and we at this point we're like crouched way down some people are covering their faces <laughs> We've all become very small in the frame. Right. And we, we just thought, well, we tried. You know, we didn't make it this year. Yeah. And, uh, and then the fifth one was us, and we all just popped up. And uh, it, was a, it was a very exciting moment. And we, um, you know, it, the, the thing that's cool for me about it is that we made this film because we wanted people to see it. We wanted, it has an, a message that's very important right. to us. And the nomination just means that a lot more people are going to see it. And that was what mm -hmm. delighted us the most. We actually have a video of that, that pop-up moment. If you want, if you want it, it's, it's pretty amusing. Do you have it? Is it, is, is it 
is it like on YouTube now or is it, uh, it's on, it's on social media. I can get it for you though. Okay. We can put a link to it in the, um, in the show notes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Why don't don't we do that? Um, well, before we, why don't you, uh, go ahead and tell our, you know, for our audience, uh, if they haven't had a chance to see this, um, what is uh, Stranger at the Gate all about? Maybe give us a, a brief synopsis. Sure. It's about a U.S. Marine who comes back from 25 years of service uh, abroad in war zones all over the world. And when he comes back, he's filled with hatred toward Muslims. And he's so angry and so mixed up that he decides he's going to blow up the mosque in his local town, which is in Muncie, Indiana. Right. So he, he goes over to the mosque to do a little recon. He's already built the bomb. And when he arrives at the mosque, he's greeted by the congregants there. And they include uh, a couple of Afghan refugees, uh, an African-American convert, and some other folks who welcome him into the mosque. And they actually treat him with kindness and they're very, you know, compassionate and welcoming. And uh, at that point, the, the story and the film take a really um, interesting mm-hmm. turn and uh, things sort of go in a different direction. Yeah. I, think, I don't know yeah, how much you want me to tell about Yeah, well, you know what? Maybe we'll just put the little <laughs> spoiler alert out right now, uh, just yeah. to tell people that... So, first of all, I didn't even say, I think this is this film. Um, well, I had a screener, but I didn't really need it, right? Because you can just find it on YouTube, I think. That's right. it, yeah, so it's publicly available. You don't need to stream. You don't need to subscribe to one of those famous streamers that we often talk about on this show. So, uh, uh, so go watch it. It's uh, because, yes, I wasn't sure even how to approach this either, uh, because it's not, you know, it, it's, I, I guess maybe when you're thinking about this, the filming of this, I mean, there's a purpose to this. It's not just to have a surprise ending or anything. There, you, you are showing something, a tra- something that's happened that's totally unexpected. Um, and I think as the, uh, I think his name's Mac McKinney, even his daughter says it's a, a story that no one, when she starts to tell it, no one believes. So if you haven't had a chance, go check it out. Um, and before, and maybe, you know, uh, before we even go further than that, maybe uh, just to say that, uh, as you said, he wants to blow up the is- Islamic center. Um, and y- you said it was to do recon, but, it, you know, he could have... Was I mean one thing I don't know if the film exactly mentions, but why did he do that first? Because he could have he, he he did more than recon. He just kind of he was lurk, he, but he did actually go in and he actually did meet people with there. I mean that was a fortuitous um, decision on his part, and certainly on how people reacted to him. Because um, he could have just said, "Look, I'm I'm I hate these people. I'm going to blow them up." Yeah, yeah. So what happened was he had an eight year old daughter. And they were very close. And her name is Emily. And one day she came home from school and she told him that she had a Muslim friend, you know, another Mm -hmm. little eight year old uh, little boy. And uh, when he heard about that, when Mac heard about it, he freaked out. He like flipped out on her, started yelling Mm -hmm. in this big fight. And he actually went to his room and started weeping because Mm -hmm. he was so upset that you know, these Muslim people were getting close to his daughter. And, you know, his daughter was like, what is wrong with you? You know, she's eight years old and she's looking at it, looking him in the eye and just like saying like, are you like, are you crazy? Like what's wrong with you? And that got through to him. And he had this moment where he said to himself, I need to get a little more information. I need to That's gather right. some That's more right. yeah. data yeah. before I do this. Cause I, I need uh, to prove that I'm right. I need to prove all these other people that they're yeah. wrong and I'm right. So that's why he went to the mosque that day to do recon mm. was actually because his eight year old daughter kind of got him to think about it for a second. Yeah. And he was, and he started to question himself just a tiny bit. So like that interaction created this little crack in, mm. in his armor. And it sent him on this journey to um, actually meet the people that he was planning to murder. Yeah. And how did you come across this incredible story? 
is this coming out of your uh, Secret Life of Muslims project? Yes, been yeah, yeah. So I've for the last eight years I've been doing a series uh, or a, a set of short documentaries called The Secret Life of Muslims. They're all they're all on YouTube, um, and we the you know that series came about because I grew up in upstate New York and mm -hmm. I was you know a Jewish kid. There weren't that many Jewish kids, and I got treated badly you know i was made fun of um kids call me jew kike jewish mm. josh yeah. threw pennies at me to uh you know show me that oh jews are cheap pick up the pennies you know that oh, sort of God. thing yeah. yeah and um someone threw a rock through the front window of our home and just things like that that you know as a little boy they stayed stay with you and mm. after 9 11 at that point i was a working filmmaker and I um I saw you know my Muslim friends facing hate, and I it was very familiar to me. And at that point, I thought, okay, maybe there's something I can do as a filmmaker to tell stories that might counter this kind of hate. And that was when we started doing the series Secret Life of Muslims. So we um, came across this story in our research in a newspaper article, and it was you know I think it was USA Today university edition and oh, wow. uh, you know we which is pretty obscure yeah. and someone on my team anna Rowe, she found the article and we were like oh my god this story is insane you know mm. a u.s marine goes to a mosque and he's going to blow it up and then should i should i spoil it yet when do we spoil it are we waiting we are talking about a man who is completely transformed in a very short period of time in terms of Mac McKinney, this Marine who is going to blow up an Islamic center in Muncie, Indiana. Um, maybe you can tell us a little, have you, had you ever come across any, another situation quite like this? I mean, you're no. an experienced filmmaker, but I mean, it's, it's just remarkable. No, I mean, this is one of those once in a lifetime stories you come across, you know, it's the guy was, you know, wanted to commit mass murder. He wanted to erase Muslims from the, you know, from where he was, was going to try to kill 200 people with a bomb at the local mosque. And when he goes there to check it out, you know, the first thing that happens is the people there who are in the film, they greet him with kindness and they welcome him in and they, you know, gave him a Quran. And, and one of them, the uh, Sabra Barami, who's one of the founders of the mosque, right, right. gets down on his knees and hugs Mac's legs and welcomes him in, you know, and Mac is like, what is going on? This is not what was supposed to happen. I thought they were going right. to be strange and, and mean and maybe even threaten me. Right. And uh, instead they're being kind. And he was confused, but it was enough that he actually came back the next day. Mac came back the next day to the mosque and he started hanging out there and asking them questions and wondering about, islam and trying to learn and over the course of time they started inviting him over for you know for meals and mm -hmm. hanging out with him and uh you know he became part of the community and after eight weeks he decided that he wanted to join the community officially and he yeah. uh, actually converted to islam and joined the community and then after that they found out that he was had intended to murder them and that so, happened after. So they, they that happened after. So yeah. this guy is a member of their mosque. And then they, they hear rumors like, oh, you know, Mac was planning to murder you guys. He had a bomb. And so Bibi Barami, who's one of the heroes of this story, yeah. she's also, she's a, um, one of the co-founders of the mosque. And she and Saber Barami, her husband, uh, founded the mosque together. Yeah. They, um, they invited him over for dinner to confront him. You know, and so they knew he, they heard he tried, was trying to kill them. So they invited him over for dinner, made a delicious meal for him. They all sat down together. And um, when he was done eating, BB just looked him in the eye and said, is it true that you were planning to murder us? And Mac admitted that it was true. And he said to them, look, if I had known better, um, if I had known you, I wouldn't have ever thought of doing this. I just didn't know. 
And uh, he learned from their kindness and from getting to know them as people that his ideas about this group, you know, about Muslims was just wrong. Mm. And um, they transformed him into a different kind of person. And ultimately he ended up, not only did they forgive him and allow him to remain in the community, but they, um, but he became president of the mosque uh, for a while. <laughs> so yeah, that, that, a, that was in one of the titles towards the, at the end of yeah. the film. I was just, <laughs> it's just absolutely amazing. But it's just, in, you know, to me, what I love about this story is, you know, it's a story we need right now. You know, we're, mm. we're so divided. We don't talk to each other anymore. Like you find out that yeah. someone, you know, voted for the, the, presidential candidate you didn't vote for you might stop talking with them you know yeah. like like that stuff is happening now where we're we're not we're not really connecting with each other anymore if we if, we're, if we think we're different from others yeah. and that's really a sad thing for humanity and yeah. Yeah. i think what this film shows is it shows the power of connection the power mm -hmm. of of being open and reaching out to people who are different than us and giving them a chance and trying to find that that mm. shared humanity that we have with each other just trying mm. to find it because it's always there you know and um the fact that you know bibi and sabra barami who founded the mosque mm. can to this day be friends with richard mckinney the guy who wanted to murder them and blow up their mosque the fact that they're friends today yeah shows me that anything is possible that we yeah. can build impossible bridges between each other and it gives me hope about the future of, of our world. So that's what I love about this story. Well, I think it's, it, and it, it really is as simple as it just comes down to being and showing love, right? You know, having, yes. you know, and, and, and a sense of community and these sort of things. Because they could have, I mean, they on themselves, I mean, this guy is a pretty hulking <laughs> a, a formidable character that we're talking about. They could have been very scared off, but they just immediately welcomed him into their to their lives. Um, and I mean, it does seem your film, and I think that's what you were getting to at the beginning when we first started chatting. Um, um, this does seem to be affecting a lot of people, if based on the YouTube comments I'm seeing, at least. Um, is that yeah. what you're, is that the experience you have already with, with this I film? mean, we've had 70 plus screenings of the film yeah. and, you know, usually we have BB in the audience and on, mm. on a panel, you know, she's the hero of the film and she's the one who welcomed Mac into her, into the mosque and welcomed him into yeah. her home. And, you know, when the film is over and people come up to, to see BB, they, you know, they, some people fall into her arms and they just, you know, they're weeping mm. because she, and their tears of joy, you know, because she gives people hope and she shows them a way to be in the world that is about grace. You know, like I, I was at a screening recently where um, a woman fell into her arms and was crying and, and she said she was Ukrainian. And mm. she said, "Baby, she said, I'm crying because I have hate in my heart right now. Wow. You know, I've, I have colleagues. She was a doctor and she, yeah. she said, I have colleagues here who are Russian and right. I know I should be friends with them, but I'm so angry right now that I hate mm. them and I don't want to live this way. And she said, what can I do? Can you help me? You know, and it's, wow. it's like, the way that BB approaches the world, there's it's inspiring, and people are looking for that. People are people want to figure out how we can coexist, and I think this film gives a bit of a, a blueprint for that. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the um, one of the things that really struck me when um, when we finished the film, we actually had a screening of it at at the mosque where we you know where the story mm -hmm. took place. And we, we showed the film in the basement of the mosque and about 80 people showed up and, you know, I didn't know what they were going to think, but I wanted to share it with them first. And when the film was over and the lights came up, uh, one guy in the back of the room raised his hand and he said, I just want to say one thing. I believe that every American needs to see this film. Hmm. And 
in that moment, I thought two things. One, I was relieved. You know, I thought, okay, yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. I liked it. We, yeah, yeah. we achieved our goals. And the other thing I thought was, wow, that is, that's a burden and an obligation that I, I'm willing to take on. Mm. And, you know, that's our goal now. It's like, how do we make sure that every American sees this film? And we're, that's, our, that's what we're working on. And that's why the Oscar nomination is so exciting yeah, because, yeah. you know, it, it gives us a chance to reach a big audience. And, um, and I, think to, uh, I think to possibly change hearts and minds, I, I know I see that happening at the screenings. You know, mm. I see people um, after the film feeling different and feeling optimistic and feeling like they want to approach their lives differently and be more open. And, and you know, it's the call to action in this film is really something yeah. everyone can do. It's, it's be kind to your neighbor. Yeah. welcome the stranger yeah. you know yeah. open your heart yeah. to people you might find some common shared humanity with them yeah. and if everyone acted that way or if more people acted that way if they acted like bb barami did in our film i know the world would be a better place mm. and it's something all of us can do so that inspires me and at a moment like we are in right now it mm. it just feels it feels right. You know, it feels like what people are looking for. And that's exciting. Uh, uh, to the point that what's coming in my head is probably, you don't want to hear this, but I think you need a whole franchise of these. <laughs> you need to find <laughs> these stories where the people like, the, you know, not, not that you're going to be able to find the exact kind of, this is an incredible story in its own, but I agree. Um, it is something that even for those who aren't even feel that they're on one side or the other, I know a lot of people who are just very depressed about the whole direction of, mm -hmm. of the world and the U S specifically sometimes. And this, you know, um, I mean, I've got, I've got friends who say they can't, we've got mutual friends, but we can't, they can't invite them over for dinner parties because they voted for different people, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and that's new. It didn't used to be that way, right? It was, I mean, 10 years ago, I, I mean, I used to have Republican friends, and, <laughs> you know, and like, I don't have as many anymore. And not like, none of my friends do. It's just like, we're not. Well, I'm we're based not, here. Yeah, I'm, I'm based here in the UK. And I've got someone came up, some younger guys came up to me and goes, yeah, I hear that in the old days, like, people who were in the same towns, people who were Republicans and Democrats used to come over to each other's houses. And right. I'm like, yeah, we didn't know. I mean, we didn't know whose party anyone belonged to. You just, yeah. we all were just part of one neighborhood. And uh, yeah. yeah, no, it is crazy that it's gotten to this point. So thank you for making this film. I think it's, uh, it is, uh, it's, it's, it's a lovely film. I think it's got a lovely message. And I'm sure uh, it's one that, well, it's glad, I'm glad to hear that it's resonating. Let's put it that way. Yeah. I mean, what, one other thing I want to say is that at all of our screenings, when BB is there, Mm -hmm. she um i've never seen this before i made a lot of films and i've done a lot of screenings but she actually shows up with a suitcase and she opens it up and takes out a giant tupperware container <laughs> filled with home-baked cookies oh wow and she passes them out to the audience yeah. and i've never seen that before it's beautiful but it encapsulates her spirit and in a way the message of the film which is like, let's connect with each other. Let's find a way to, you know, we don't know each other, but let's get to know each other. And if it means like sharing cookies together or coming over for dinner, what better way to get to know someone that you, you don't know? You know, it's, it's, um, and that's the spirit of the film. And it's what she did with this, you know, this would be domestic terrorist. She invited him over for dinner mm. and that changed his, his mind. It changed his, the direction and, made for a beautiful outcome and there's a power in that there's a power in connecting and um and and that's what the film is really about okay and what's next for you after this well we have a few more weeks of you know doing screenings and our our executive producer malala is mm -hmm. um leading a lot of these screenings she'll be at them and we're very excited about that in fact we just did a screening in london uh Okay. with Malala uh, last week. And, uh, and so she's an amazing champion for the film. And uh, I feel like she's like the living embodiment of the message of our film. So it's very <laughs> exciting to have her be a part of our team. After this, <clears throat> to, you know, one of the things we're doing, you, you mentioned like 
maybe we need a lot of films with this yeah. kind of message. Um, yeah. We are working on a new one, <clears throat> which is about a a 9-11 hate crime victim, a guy who was shot in the mm. face, survived, and um, his story of transformation and his activism uh, now. And so that's something we're working on, on right okay. now. And it's really part of this same suite of films about yeah. where we're telling stories where people stand up to hate and yeah. think, try to think about ways to transform others. Okay. Well, uh, I wish you well. Keep making such wonderful films and inspirational films. Uh, I hope everyone uh, is inspired by this. It's uh, just to remind our listeners, we've been uh, talking with uh, Joshua Seftel, the award-winning director and producer of Stranger at the Gate, nominated in the Best Short Doc category. And if you hadn't already, despite many our many entreaties, please go check it out on YouTube, and you too will be inspired. Joshua, thank you so much. It's been great to have you on. Thank you so much, Matthew. Yeah, take care. I also would like to thank those who helped make this podcast possible. A big shout out to Sam and Joe at Intersound Audio in York, England. A big thanks to Amy Ord, our podcast manager at Alamo Pictures, who ensures we continue getting great guests onto the show and that everything otherwise runs smoothly. Finally, a big thanks to our listeners. Many of you have been with us for four incredible seasons. Please keep sending us feedback and episode ideas, whether it is on YouTube, social media, or directly by email. Please also remember to like us and share us with your friends and family, wherever you happen to listen or watch podcasts. This is Factual America, signing off. You've been listening to Factual America. This podcast is produced by Almo Pictures, specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for international audiences. Head on down to the show notes for more information about today's episode, our guests, and the team behind the podcast. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Alamo Pictures. Be the first to hear about new productions, festivals showing our films, and to connect with our team. Our homepage is alamopictures.co.uk.